All right. Good afternoon, everybody. What's going on? This is your girl, Tiffany, coming through live in effect. So today, I want to be dealing with a, a topic about a speech that was given by an activist, a pan-Africanist, an abolitionist. Well, I wouldn't say he was an abolitionist. He was a journalist. It's called The Reason Why Negroes, um, or The Reason Why Colored People should move to Africa. That was the name of his speech. And the person that I'm talking about is John Edward Bruce. So I'm going to read a little bit about his background and then I'm going to go into the speech. So the speech that he did, it started on November the 1st of 1877. Okay. So that's when the speech uh, began. And it was in a publication called The Christian... Let me get let me let me make sure I have it right. Okay, it was in a, a publication called the Christian Recorder. Okay, so you gotta remember a lot of those Pan Africanists at that time they were Christians, and you also had different Pan Africanists that was in the background that was in other religion as well, but mainly in Christianity. So the reason why I'm I chose this topic because um, I thought the speech was very powerful when I took a look at it and by it being dealing with Pan-Africanism, um, I, I felt like maybe this is something I would want to share with the people. So that was the reason why I chose that topic, you know, cause I wanted to share something and be able to share a speech. So yeah, things are kind of like out of order. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And things are very chaotic at the moment with African Americans, especially dealing with this pandemic and then the police brutality and whatnot. And so, you know, I had that in my spirit at the reading the article. I said, you know what? This is something that I want to present to the people. This is something I want. I want to uh, have a discussion about and share. So, anyways, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Make sure you guys subscribe and hit the notification bell and also share this channel and share the video. Please do so, okay? So let's go ahead and get started, shall we? All right. All right, so who was John Edward Bruce? So John Edward Bruce, also known as Bruce Grit or J.E. Bruce Grit. Right, he was born February the 22nd, 1856, and August the 7th, 1924 is when he died. He was an American journalist, historian, writer, moderator. Moderator is somebody who's a, a speaker, like a motivational speaker. And he was a civil rights activist and a pan African a pan African nationalist. Okay, he was born in he was born into slavery in Maryland. As an adult, he founded numerous newspapers along the East Coast, as well as co-founding with Arthur Alfonso Schwamberg. And for those of you who don't know um, Mr. Schwamberg, he was responsible for studying the Africans in Latin America and the Caribbeans. So he, he studied a lot on uh, Afro-Latinos history. So yeah, Artur he, he goes by the name Artario Alfonso Schwamberg, but in English, he's author. Anyways, the Negro Society for Historical Research in New York. Um, so let's look at a little bit more about his background then. It says, uh, early life and education. Bruce was born in a 1856, uh, Picataway, Maryland, to enslaved parents, Robin, I mean, Robert and Martha Allen Clark Bruce. When he was three years old, his father was sold to a slaveholder in Georgia. Bruce never saw or heard from him again. He and his mother fled to Washington, D.C. and later to Connecticut, where Bruce enrolled in an integrated school and received his first formal education. Traveling back to Washington later, he received a private education and attended Howard University for a three-month course. After that, he never pursued a formal education again and was mostly self-taught. 
And the term that we use today for self-taught is autodidact. In 1874, at the age of 18, Bruce earned a job as a messenger for the associate editor of the New York Times Washington office. His duties included getting information for the next day's paper from Senator Charles Sumner, a Republican who supported civil rights for African-Americans. All right. So let's skip down a little bit. All right. But well, let's go to his career in Washington, D.C. in 1879. Bruce and Charles N. Otley founded the Argus Weekly newspaper. They decided that the paper would be a fearless advocate of the true principles of the Republican Party and the moral and intellectual investment of the Negro American. It was a time of flourishing projects in the black community. Then it goes on to say next, Bruce founded the Sunday Item in 1880, the Republican in 1882, both in Norfolk, Virginia. He served as the associate edit editor and business manager of the Baltimore, Maryland Commonwealth in 1884. All right. And so further down, it says he, Bruce also became prominent on the lecture circuit, giving speeches that addressed lynching, the condition or I mean, the condition of Southern blacks and the weak American political system that failed to protect the rights of its black citizens. In 1890, he joined activist T. Thomas Fortune's Afro-American League, the first organized black civil rights groups in the nation. He became the organization's new, new president in 1890 when it reformed as the Afro-American Council. All right. Bruce was a member of the Literary Bureau of the Republican National Committee in 1900. By 1908, he had followed the Great Migration to New York. There in 1908, he established the Yonkers, excuse me, he established the Yonkers New York Weekly Standard. Beginning in 1910, he served as American correspondent for the African Times and Orient Review of London, England, edited by Dusay Muhammad Ali. That name should sound familiar to some people, Dusay Muhammad Ali. In Yonkers, he also worked as a probation officer in 1910. All right. So let's look at the arm and self-defense. So during the American uh, Reconstruction era and after many black leaders espoused nonviolent strategies for social change, appalled at the rise of lynchings and imposition of legal segregation, Bruce supported us. Excuse me, Bruce supported armed self defense against racist attacks. Let me read that again. Bruce supported armed self defense against racist attacks. He is quoted as saying, The man who will not fight for the protection of his wife and children is a coward and deserves to be ill treated. The man who takes his life in his hand and stands up for what he knows to be right will always command the respect of his enemy. He supported organized resistance to organized resistance. All right. So therefore, Mr. Bruce was a very radical guy like Marcus Garvey. Okay. He was really about the right for his people and to bear arms and self-defense. And he spoke out against lynching because lynching happened a lot especially within the southern states so there was a lot of lynching going on in the south and he was one of the main proponents that stood up and really spoke out against all of these things that were happening and taking place with the people all right so let's see if you guys are interested to look at look into more details about this or if you want to read more information about John Edward Bruce all right and you know what's my fate let's look down here where it says later career 
Okay, so in Harlem and Yonkers, Bruce became involved with the emerging community of intellectual, including newly arrived immigrants from the Caribbean. In 1911, with Arthur Schwamberg from Puerto Rico, he founded the Negro Society for Historical Research, first based in Yonkers, to create an institute to support scholarly efforts. For the first time, it brought together African, West Indian, and Afro-American scholars. This later became the foundation for the Schwamberg Center for Research in Black Culture, New York Public Library on Malcolm S. Boulevard in Harlem. Okay. Bruce also was a member to Herbert Henry Harrison, the young migrant from St. Croix, or St. Croix, if I'm saying it right. Okay, it's pronounced the St. Croix. Okay. Who became influential in Black socialism and Black nationalism. Bruce's belief in an independent international, I mean, excuse me, independent national destiny for blacks in the United States led him in the period around 1919 to embrace Jamaican Marcus Garvey's pan-African nationalism. As a member of Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association, Bruce wrote for the movements Negro World and the Daily Negro Times. All right. And then it goes on to say that he was a Prince Hall Mason, a member of the Humane Order of African Redemption and the African Society of London, now the Royal African Society. So he was a Mason, indeed. So, yeah, therefore, he was very, he was straight pan Africanist. He was about the unification of all African people throughout the diaspora. And he was a Mason. He was uh, a member of the Prince Hall Masonry. And also the Humane Order of African Redemption and the Royal African Society. Okay. So now let's look at the speech that he wrote. Okay, let's. Go ahead. All right. So right here. So I'm here on blackpass.org. So blackpass.org is one of the best website to go to if you want to find out any more information dealing with African or African American history, this is the website you should try to go on. Okay? So, blackpass.org and the title of this speech is John E. Bruce Reasons Why the Color American Should Go to Africa. Now, they use the term color because that was how black people was described back then. They would describe either color or Negro. All right. Now listen to this. And this goes for you ADOS people and you indigenous people out there that want to talk all that stuff. Listen to what he had to say. All right. As African-American increasingly realized that reconstruction would not usher in permanent citizenship rights and in fact did not protect them from violence. Some black leaders began to call for alternative approaches. Not surprisingly, a some, a some again urged African-American colonization in Africa. In October 1877, journalist John Edward Bruce added his voice to the colonization movement in a speech outlining why African Americans should return to the ancestral land. The speech, which was first published in Christian Recorder on November the 1st, 1877, appears below. All right. Now, remember, this is 1877. This was before Marcus Garvey was even thought of or came about. So this man already had a pan-African mindset. Okay? So it starts off saying, I shall endeavor to show tonight why the color American should immigrate to Africa first. Because Africa is 
his fatherland. Secondly, because before the war in the South, he was a slave and in the North, a victim of prejudice and ostracism. And thirdly, because since the close of the war, although he has been freed by emancipation and invested with enfranchisement, he is only normality free. And lastly, because he is still a victim of prejudice and practically proscribed socially, religiously, politically, educationally, and in the various industrial pursuits. First, then he should immigrate to Africa because it is his fatherland. Africa is a country rich in its production, offering untold treasures to the inventor who may go there. It has a particular claim upon the color American in this country. And that claim is as just as equitable as any could be. 150 millions of our people are on the other side of the board Atlantic, groving in darkness and superstition. Five millions are on this side, surrounded by the advantages that could be desired in the march towards civilization. It is our duty to carry to those benighted, darkened minds a light to guide them in the march towards civilization. For centuries, the color race has not been highly educated. This is this has not always been the fact in history which shows what has been done, proves what may yet be. The Africans held possessions of Southern Egypt when Isaiah wrote, Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands unto God. When the queen of Sheba brought added wealth to be treasures of Solomon, and when a princely and learned Ethiopian became a herald of Christ before public, I mean, excuse me, before Paul, the Hebrew, Cornelius, or the European soldiers were converted. The race to whom had been given the wonderful continent of Africa can be educated and elevated to wealth, power, and stations among the nations of the earth. And then he goes out and says, secondly, why the color American should immigrate to Africa is because before the war in the South, he was a slave. Okay, yeah. Yeah, before the war in the South, he was a slave, and in the North, he was a victim of Persian ostracism. During the cruel days of slavery, the color American had no right, which the white American was bound to respect. He was a, a was a nonentity before the law and auto auto with a immortal soul. Old Massa had full power and control over him and his postery his relatives children and friends who were dear to him were snatched up anytime by old master and sold into slavery driven into misery everlasting woe and discontentment so much for slavery thirdly why the color American should immigrate to of Africa is because since the war, although he had been freed by emancipation and investment and enfranchisement, he is only normally free. His rights are ab abridged. He is an American only in name. The doors of the public schools are closed against his children, notwithstanding the fact that he is tasked to support them. The common carriers hotels and places of amusement refuse to recognize him as a free man, no matter what his ranks or station may be. He cannot enjoy the privilege which the constitution, the supreme law of the land guarantees to the humblest citizen. The atrocious, the atrocious massacre of unoffending colored men during the past five years in the states of Mississippi, South Carolina, and Louisiana have blacken the page of American history and cast a gloom over the whole civilized world. Innocent men and women were butchered in cold blood by the inhumane wenches who glory in the name American citizen. 
These brutal murders were committed in defiance of all law and justice. Men can never forget them. The blood of thousands of our race cries aloud unto the God of justice and the day of retribution is not far distant. <clears throat> and then it says, and lastly, why the color American should immigrate to Africa is because he is still a victim of prejudice and practically prescribed socially, religiously, and politically. He cannot enter a hotel and obtain accommodation without paying a double price. Should he be successful in entering at all? If he go to church of God in this Christian land, he is thrust into the gallery. If he go to the if he wants to go south, he is packed in the car nearest the engine so that he will be the first killed in case of a collision. Politically, he is a failure and cannot begin in, I mean, begin to compete with his white brother. He is used by him in all dirty jobs to advance his interests to fill his pockets with ill-gotten gains. He is virtually a tool and a scapegoat in this respect and he is regarded as indispensable auxiliary in times of elections by these unscrupulous and unprincipled demigods who are at a degrade a disgrace and a curse to such a republic as this claims to be and now, Mr. President, I think I have shown why the color American should immigrate to Africa. It is to his interest and his gain to do so. He is surrounded on every hand by prejudice and opposition, and it remains for him to carve out for himself a destiny among the nations of the earth. All right. So, again, that was a very powerful speech, very strong speech. Now, let's Go ahead and take a review. Um, first and foremost, I want to give peace to the chat. Jose, he was not an Illuminati. No, just because somebody is a Mason does not make them a part of any type of Illuminati. All right. If you know anything about the Masonic organization, it's basically dealing with fraternal order, meaning that it's more so about brotherhood. Okay. So let's not get that messed up with the Illuminati. All right. Cause that's not what it was all about. And peace to uh, brother Matulu Pata. Thank you for coming in. All right. So I want to take a review of this information real fast. Let's go back to the top. Now let's start where he says that. First, then he should immigrate to Africa because it is his fatherland. Now, many people refer to Africa as the motherland, right? But in this case, I will see why he said fatherland because he's speaking from the patriarchal point of view. So and then he goes on to say that Africa is a country rich in its productions, offering untold treasure to the in investor who may go there. So yes, Africa, the continent itself is considered as the one, the richest continent in the world. If you notice that a lot of people are feeding off the resources there, all the natural resources at this point, we talking about gold, we talking about oil, we're talking about um, coal mine. And we, if you guys don't know what the coal mine is, it's used to make batteries for cell phones and things like that. So all your iPhones and stuff like that, they get those coal mines from the people in the Congo. So it's the people, the Congolese people that's digging up all these coal, all this material that is needed to make the cell phone devices. All right. So Africa has a lot of the resource and that's why you got continents like Europe and Asia that's feeding off of it because they don't have that plethora of resources like the continent of Africa does. And not to mention, it's like the second largest continent in the world. Okay. Then it, he went on to say that 150 million of our people are on the other side of the broad Atlantic, globing in dark 
darkness and superstition. Five millions are on this side, surrounded by all the advantages that could be desired in the march towards civilization. Yeah, so what he's saying is our lineage and our ancestry, our people, is on one coast in Africa, right? While the rest of us, the five million of us, is over here trying to fight for what is right and fight for liberation in this country. All right, and then if you notice down here, he used biblical verses because remember, he was a Christian, okay? So a lot of black people was Christian and they was heavy into Christianity. So they used the Bible as a, a reference point and not only a reference point, but also as a book to deliver speech with as well. So, so the Bible was always used as a reference book and a book of education. And it was the, it was the main book that a lot of slaves started to learn how to read from. Right. So they started to learn how to read just by reading the Bible and reading the scriptures. And from there, they were able to take the information and, you know, use the metaphors as to apply it into their daily life or to um, convey a point. Um, let's see, let's go down to here where it says, secondly, why the colored American should immigrate to Africa is because before the war in the South, he was a slave and in the North, a victim of prejudice and ostracism. That's the fact, okay? Even though slavery was taking place in the North, but slavery was heavily practiced in the South, all right? It was heavily practiced in the South. So prior to the American Revolution, right, and the Civil War, Blacks were just known for being slaves. They didn't really have any rights. And even after those wars took place, they still didn't really have rights. They still didn't have the le um excuse me they still didn't have the luxury to go out and do things that their white counterparts was doing so they weren't given that type of leverage all right their their freedom was only limited and now i want to scroll down here because i seen something as i was reading which really stands out the most um, to me. Okay, here it is right here. He said, he said his rights are abroad. He is an American only in name. The doors of the public schools are closed against his children, notwithstanding the fact that he is tasked to support them. Now, again, this was written in 1877. Now, if you take what was going on in the 50s and the 60s, this is exactly what was happening. So he was only so African-Americans was only Americans in name because of the nationality. But overall, they were not really considered as citizens or they weren't treated as such. All right. So it has not been that long ago that integration in schools took place in the 50s. Now, we're talking about the 50s. That was about 60 something years ago. Uh, integration on the bus. That was almost 60 something years ago. Civil Rights Act took place in 1965, which was around 55 years ago. So we're not that far removed from that. We're not that far removed. So he was right. And he was on point with this. He's only considered as an American in name. So black people was only considered as American by name, but they did not consider as American as far as being citizens is concerned or as people of the land. All right. 
And so um, when I think of this, and I know this guy look kind of mean, don't he? he look like he ain't no joke. <laughs> you can see the facial expression here. But what I think of this, uh, I think this speech was very powerful and very strong. Um, you can tell that he was a very uh, radical person and he was a very um, eloquent speaker just by how he, just how the paragraph and how things are formatted in this, in the speech. So you can tell he was very direct. So he didn't come off as being very, very kind or very uh, humble. He came off as being very compassionate and very stern and, and straightforward. So a lot of black people at that time period, if you was, if you get, if you gave this kind of speech and you were very radical, then you were seen as being a problem. You were seen as being a problem and you were seen as being, and you were, you were going to be labeled as a, a, as a threat. So if you had black men such as John E. Bruce, Marcus Garvey, or Booker T. Washington, who are very powerful men and who are very eloquent speaker, or even somebody like Carter G. Woodson, who was an eloquent speaker, you become a threat. That was a problem, especially to the white people, especially to white men. That became a problem to them. They seen that, oh, black men being so radical, being very vocal and very uh, outspoken. We got to keep a close tab on this this individual. We got to watch his every move because we don't know what he might do at this point. So that's a threat. And this is why and it's so funny because you hear other black people today, especially in the entertainment business, criticizing those who may speak out against uh, the, the injustice, the inequality that's taking place. They'll be like, well, you can't say it like this or you can't portray yourself this way. You can't do it this way. Or this is not how you speak out. Because if you do it this way, then you're going to cause the rest of us not to get the benefit of weeping the opportunity of those benefits. So what, what we call the house Negroes, what they'll try to do is shut down the field Negroes or they'll try to put those Negroes, to, the other Negroes to the side and say, you know what, you got to go somewhere. You can't speak because, see, now you finna get us all in trouble. You finna get us all messed up. And that's very common, especially when they get to this higher level, such as the industry, the entertainment industry, and you got one black person that's really speaking out against all things or speaking out what's going on, then they'll try to do whatever they can to shut, them, shut that person down by taking them off of air or they're going to try to distance themselves to in order to protect their investment and protect their pockets. But anyways, that's all I wanted to share with you guys today. Yep, that's all I wanted to share with you guys today. Uh, I thank you all for watching. For those of you that's tuning in, as you can see, my... Um, my video don't went out, so I usually go through that issue from time to time. But until then, you guys, please take it easy on yourself. And I will reconnect with you all later. And if you want to share the video, you're more than welcome to do so. If you want to subscribe to the channel, please make sure you do that as well. So you all have a wonderful afternoon. And until next time, may peace and power elevation be to you all. This is your girl, Tiffany, and I'm logging off. All right. Thank you. Peace.